Hey. I want to talk a little bit about the deep structure of the shaman and this wild experiment that we have been running for 11 years. So far, it's working pretty well. But we hit a snag a few weeks ago when a few of you got a little irritated at me for the way that I run the 2D version of the Shala, which is based on voluntarism, self-placement on a sliding scale, and a sense of stewardship without oversight from me. So all of these are principles that are a hundred times more important once we get into three-dimensional space where we're actually touching each other's bodies and I'm paying a lot of rent. Um, but even on the two-dimensional scale, these ideas of you taking responsibility for manage your own account religiously and understanding that we're in an environment where there's a lot of diversity of how much people are, are voluntarily contributing on a monetary level is different and it's weird and the, the sort of pushback that I got last month was from people just saying, Angela, this is actually not efficient. Why don't you just tell us how much to pay, put us on auto pay, automate this system so that we can sort of get on a roll. Let sort of capitalism run this show. There are so many ways that capitalism can take things out of your hands and, and establish structures with which you can operate and do your work. Why are you doing it the hard way? It's a good question, and it's not one that I'm actually ever going to compromise on. Um, so for those of you who feel a little like, like alienated by that because it's so not the value system that we work on in transactional relationships, I wanted to do a little story time and talk a little bit about what this experiment has been you know, thus far. Um, and hopefully in the process, uh, reveal a little bit of why this matters for the entity that our shala is. You know, the shala is not me, it's not you, it's a entity with its own values and its own personality that at this point, as an 11 year old, really has quite a bit of, quite a bit of uh, power to keep reproducing those values if we, if we keep in mind why it was born and in what way. And the, the answer to that is, I wanted a space that would be safe for the long run for diverse people to practice in, be accessible, that for that reason would need to be a non-competitive vibe in the space. And one, the second would honor the long tradition of yoga in a way that to some degree participated less in the, the colonial project that has brought yoga to the United States um, and doesn't reproduce the labor relations that really incentivize the tremendous watering down of that method so that it can be scaled up and made more accessible and more mainstreamed. So instead of trying to make a lot of teachers and have a lot of uh, you know, notoriety and, and be a 
advertising broadly. The focus in the spirit of honoring what the method actually is instead of milking it for uh, fame and money has been to focus on the expertise of teachers. So I didn't start teaching until 10 years of practice. And if I were to follow a more sort of capitalist incentive structure, I would be looking to each and every one of you as potential uh, laborers on whom I could sort of offload the, the duties of, of the instructor, right? On the flip side, what we're doing is cultivating an environment where people who have 10 years of maturation and appreciation, reverence for the method, are in a place where they can also potentially make this very, very vulnerable move out of listening purely inside to their, to their experience based on some level of expertise, moving into listening to the experiences of others and helping them as they move forward. That transition, if it's done by amateurs, a lot, not only of expertise, but humility drops out of the picture. So that's the big rationale, is having a space that's safe and accessible and uh, approach to the method that's respectful and doesn't water down the practice and the, and the methodology itself. So if I were running this place in the natural, normal way in this context, which would be to think like a, think like a, a sort of person who's building a business, um, the first thing that in service of that project, I would actually I would be quite responsible to do would be to advertise what we're doing, right? To, to grow. The, any organization that's really deeply following a capitalist model, especially if it's publicly traded, is working on a, a rationale of expansion, right? Expansion of the sort of the distribution of the product and the, uh, the knowability of the product. Not only that, in the current environment that we're in, as Shoshana Zuboff and so many of the, the students who are learning from her have really come to understand recently, the economic paradigm that we've moved into in recent years is really, as to the degree that we're digital, is one of mining the data of your customers, right? So if I were in a place of mining your data, then yeah, get you all on auto pay, tell me all your digits. Uh, that is just one part of, of getting the data and the metadata for you that allows me to grow the shala is like a digital footprint. So that's a very different set of incentives from this other orientation of having a space that's safe and a space that really doesn't participate in the, the labor incentive structures of expansion, but instead in the a labor orientation that's about just letting you focus on your practice and maybe holding space for a few ridiculously skillful people to cross a threshold into the vulnerability of teaching, right? So here's the story time piece. There was an 11-month period of my life in 2000 and 2001 where so many crucial things happened for the path that I'm on now. Things group like that in your life if you take a look back, you know? And that for me was the more I understand who I am now, 2000, 2001, was the the year that I crossed all of the thresholds into this. And I lived in Seattle that year. I'd come back from a Fulbright year in Nicaragua um, doing historical research and archives about um, revolutionaries and got married. And my partner and I had a year before we started graduate school in Los Angeles. And we're like, what are we gonna do? We could just spin our wheels and live in my parents' basement in rural Montana. Um, 
and we had four hundred dollars, and we took that four hundred dollars, and we moved to the city that was the one that I had always loved the best, which was Seattle, and that was in the moment of the dot com crash, the second one. So interesting because the the reason that I wanted to be there was the in this tiny little time slice between the WTO protests in Seattle the previous year and the war on terror starting the next year, there was this little moment when economic justice was the topic of the day. Um, we'd grown, I'd come of age in Portland uh, in the 90s, in like grunge time, right? And after those WTO protests, which happened when I was in Managua, the the fervor and the momentum for economic justice and immigrant rights on a global level was so strong amongst everyone that I knew, everywhere that I knew them. And I wanted to be at the hot, hot seat of it. And so I went and worked for a place called the Independent Media Center, which at that time we thought the internet was gonna liberate us and like connect all the justice movements. Um, and for a minute it did. And so I was there doing volunteer work as an independent journalist and also got a job, this is the crucial thing, working at the Seattle University master's program in nonprofit leadership. So I was the program officer um, for a year and basically I was just the like administrative lackey for the whole thing, but I ended up being connected to all the people who were going through essentially an MBA in not-for-profit leadership and helping to, to organize and write down what they thought of their best practices. That was kind of hard work, and right at the beginning of it, I found Ashtanga Yoga. So I started practicing at a gym, then I got Richard Freeman's videos, rolled out my mat at home. So again, like just this thing that I was doing as I was also healing my digestion from the Giardia I was carrying around, um, ended up being, uh, path dependent for the next 21 years. So the things that those MBA students taught me about how to run an organization in the midst of capitalism collapsing, which it felt like it was doing then, for higher purposes and with clear intentions that don't necessarily take the environing values of how to run a business on its own terms, that conceptual structure, there's a lot to say there, um, but in brief, has given me so much that I use day to day to figure out how to run the challenge. So much more than even you know the following decade of studies in economic sociologists, which is fun and theoretical and helped me understand to some degree the nature of empire but the practical stuff for running a nonprofit at the end of capitalism or so they thought has impacted the shala greatly um, I'll just say two of the, the operating principles that we're working with all of the time there are many others that you can perceive the longer that we're out here one is the idea that what an organization measures is what it's going to optimize for. So if let's go back to this case of the 2D shallow and the apparent inefficiency of me just not getting everybody on auto pay and telling you to like send X dollars, right? If I were measuring for X dollars, then that is what that is how the organization itself would behave. But I'm measuring for engagement on an emotional level. If you can go to the trouble to mark it on your calendar to send a trivial or non-trivial amount of money on the first of the month, that devotion that expresses through this basically like digital activity of like sending one dollar on PayPal actually gives me a sense that you care that what I am doing exists. If it's too much of a hassle for you to do that, it is definitely too much of a hassle for me to show up at all in the digital. There's actually quite a lot of emotional bandwidth 
and time that I'm investing in creating that space. So I definitely don't want to do it if you could give a care or not, um, if it existed, right? The, the thing about watching for emotional investment that I have learned the hard way over time is that if you make some sort of emotional investment in our shala, that is golden for the longevity of the organization because you then, on an implicit level, want to see it succeed. This is why with the in the 3D space, I actually really want to teach for free. Like my nature as like somebody who came up following uh, mystical Christians who uh, want to give everything away all of the time. My nature is to want to do that, especially as a spiritual practice. But we have a pay it forward program so that those who are not paying in money do a significant amount of service outside of the shala. So no, we're, the shala is not taking the labor of the people who are doing service. Uh, that is a setup for all kinds of dysfunction. Instead, they're doing service secretly outside in a way that helps them invest emotionally in the process of yoga. And in general, that emotional investment gives the shala so much depth, so much not economic power, like there's a like, there's like a energetic and spiritual fortitude that comes from those emotional investments. So that is what I am measuring for. In our books, I have firewalls set up so that I am not treating you as a student based on your monetary contribution. I am treating you as a student based on how much I see you in practice the amount of energy you're investing in your practice is how the accounting works, it's energetic. So I have more sort of data coming in about you the more that I see you and therefore the more that I can show up for you as you sort of move forward. Um, the, the incentive structure would be very different if AYA2 were seeing like a business, seeing like a, you know, a utility maximizing business. We are seeing like a school, We're seeing like a school that wants to be safe and wants to be skillful, right? So another such um, sort of best practice orientation from that year in Seattle is the idea that scale equals distance. And so, this is, this is just something that Ashtanga has learned the hard way, especially in recent decades. The farther away you are from the source of instruction, the more precious, pedestalized, and rarefied they seem, right? That's actually something that I'm guarding against when we look about the legacies of authoritarianism in sort of guru cultures, right? So we don't, from the perspective of AYA2 being sustainable, safe and skillful want to fall into a place where there's so much scale that there's a lot of distance from me and other teachers. So this is also the rationale for keeping the 2D shala small enough that I know all of your names, I have a sense of how much you're showing up and, and there are so there's an ability to be present for those of you who are there. If we, even if we doubled in size, there are certain sort of cognitive limits that I'm always pushing in terms of how many people I can track on their experience. But pretty much, you know, Robin Dunbar, the anthropologist, uh, proposed somewhere in that 150 range. Some others have said up to 200, a human mind can stay present for, but once we get much above that, you can be sure that I as a teacher will not have a, a sort of two-way stream of data port with you, and that is a setup for, that scaling is a setup for distance and some of the dysfunctions that come from, from distance in communities where we're doing contemplative practice. 
And so in a capitalist orientation, scale equals distance is awesome, right? The CEO retreats more and more into the CEO suite at the top of the building, and it scales and scales and scales and scales, right? And the labor relations there is that you see every member of the organization as potential la like every potential labor to do what you don't want to do yourself and the idea is like automate and and delegate as much of the skilled labor as you can which has the consequence of a fundamental de-skilling if the you know if the initial teacher had say in my case now like you know 20 years of of practice and, and expertise if i'm de-skilling the the expertise level down to someone who's really just entered the organization to do what would otherwise be my labor then it has this natural consequence following that incentive structure of again a sort of watering down of the expertise so there's a huge like line of discussion that would like get us all the way to a nonprofit MBA if we kept going down that line. But the the way that this connects in with the next part of my story where I actually did go to UCLA and study the history of empire in a really deep way was that these lenses of so, um, the need to sort of create scale and expansion and revenue streams and certain rationalized labor models really undergird the, the colonialist project that, that is so much of us, so deeply a part of the Indian story the last 400 years. And for those of you who are going deep into this method, I would say know your empire. And the more that you do know the imperial history and how the story of yoga gets mixed up in that, the harder it is to feel very enthusiastic about participating in, like bringing yoga into the capitalist model. But real briefly, Let's think about what that would look like if I actually did, just because it's the water that we swim in and because the, the shallow is imprecated in capitalism in important ways. You know, we do have to pay the rent. We do have to, you know, I, I purchase insurance to, you know, secure our property and such things. Um, but if I went full on into an embrace of that mandate really to expand, then back to the first thing I said, there, was, there would really be no excuse for the Shala not to advertise. And so I wanna kinda play this out. If the Shala were to pursue what is called its comparative advantage, if it were going to think like a competitive organization, which now it doesn't, the Shala does not compete with any entity. There are not other entities doing what we do, um, but if they were, they would be our sisters and brothers and, you know, like beloved friends um, in a sort of post-capitalist orientation, right? But because we're not looking for leverage or comparative advantage, I'm not thinking about the field of advertising. If we were, the comparative advantage around here would be my body and my practice and my credentials. So these are not things that enter into the picture at the Shala. We haven't created a value system around my body and my adult gymnastics practice that I do every day and my credentials, which are comparatively far, far greater than almost anyone in the field. If we did, if we pretended like that meant anything, then you'd be encouraged to value me according to those external markers, like according to the hierarchy that that implicitly sets up. And there would be a sense that like doing an adult gymnastics practice is somehow more uh, yogic than 
coming in and sitting and breathing, which it is not. In fact, it's often less yogic. Um, so the, the incentive, though, around advertising, if I were going to serve the shala on that, those terms, this would be an organization that was known, objectified around those things. The second thing that we have to offer from an advertising perspective is not just me, but you. The opportunity to practice with you, to associate with you, means not only would sort of flattened, objectified versions of my embodied practice be grist for that mill, but also actual physical depictions of your practice. Cameras in the classroom are a part of that logic. Back to the piece about safe space, I really do understand that for some people, I've, there, there can be a, a value in physical representations of your practice in sort of a, a capitalist space, right? There's, I've really sort of empathized with and, and gone into that mindset and have some empathy and understanding for it. But here, the way that we work with safe space entails a high level of permission to be coming apart at any time. Uh, understanding that you will always be held with privacy and sacredness and there's no need for your practice to look a certain way or certainly to be photogenic and the the intrusion of the eye that flattens and makes objects at particular moments of our practice in the way that we're approaching practice here the understanding that AYA2 has created for itself of what safety means is very much in tension with that, even though in certain settings I can understand how it might possibly not be intrusive. Around here, what the organization has wanted from me and from us is a, an understanding of the sacred that keeps those intrusions and potential objectifications for um, the, the market sort of completely out of the picture. So, you know, people arrive here to this place that we've, you know, allowed to grow between us over the last 11 years. And one of the pieces of feedback I get, apart from, you know, the occasional irritation about these values of volunteerism and investing emotionally and taking responsibility for the stewardship of the space. Another piece of feedback in this environment where everyone is a steward of the values and the vibe is that, wow, this is really a non-competitive space. And I would invite you to really like think about if that's true for you. Um, and what would happen to the, the vibe if the organization itself, the entity that holds us when we practice, were competing, if it were trying to figure out what its comparative advantage were, and if it were advertising, how would the, that external expression of this entity that is the shala, then as above, so below, right? How would that feel on the inside if you know, we were doing retail here, if I wanted your data? if we were thinking about who's the best at what. Um, the, the, the values that we take so for granted because we live and breathe in a, a capitalist world, actually, for most of us, don't apply here. And at first, it can be hard to, to sense that. But then, for those of us who've been around a lot, long enough to, to really feel what the shala itself is doing. I think you'll agree that these are compromises not worth making um, for, the, for the sake of what's happening here that's different. So that was a lot of economic sociology. I'll cut it off there. See you soon.